Good morning. Please have a seat. So welcome to that second day of the web conference. Um, I'm Fabian Gandon. I'm a research director at INRIA, and I have a, I'm general co-chair with my two friends over there. And uh, I have the pleasure of chairing this morning. Um, a few reminders first. Everyone who is wearing a visible orange lanyard uh, do not want his, his or her photo or videos to be taken or post posted online, so please respect that. And I remind you that there is an area over there with, which is a restricted area where you don't take pictures. Today we also have, for the first time at the web conference, a job fair, which is a speed meeting for recruiters to identify pot potential future employees and for candidates um, to find a job. So do use that new tool for our community. Tonight is the gala dinner of the web conference, the social event. And for that, I just wanted to give you a small reminder that we have been able to privatize the historical market of Lyon for you. And the gala will take in that uh, market, which is called in French Les Halles Paul Bocuse, Paul Bocuse being a very well-known chef, and you also have uh, the address. And because we have a gala tonight, tomorrow we will start later, for obvious physical reason. Um, later meaning only 20 minutes later, I'm sorry, that's the only thing I could uh, negotiate. Uh, so we will start at uh, 8.35 tomorrow morning. Now it's also a great pleasure to welcome on stage Jean-Michel Bérard, who is from the, uh, the chair of the G Digital League, and he will be introducing, I believe, the Digital Summer. Jean-Michel, please welcome him. Hello, good, good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm the, one of the two presidents of the Digital League, which is... Uh, an association of uh, companies working in the digital industry. So we gather 500 companies. Uh, we represent 20, 26,000 jobs in the region. Um, and uh, our goal is to grow together and to make this industry much bigger and much visible throughout the world. And this is the reason why uh, we uh, work with the Lyon University to host this conference for the second time in Lyon. So we are very proud to uh, welcome you and to welcome this very famous uh, conference where most of the technology that we are using uh, have been presented like 10 or 15 years ago. Um, and uh, I would like to talk briefly about uh, our annual event that we decided to merge this year with the WebConf. It's called Digital Summer. So normally it happens in July, but exceptionally this year, uh, it, we have the weather of summer, but uh, it's in spring. And uh, it's uh, a set of uh, 16 conferences where we are going to talk about uh, UX, HR, strategy for uh, companies, how to develop uh, and to grow the companies, how to attract talents, uh, how to position companies. So very down to us. It has nothing to do with the web conf as, as it is. It's really down to us, but how really to sell uh, our products and our service to uh, the companies. And uh, I thank you all for listening to me. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jean-Michel. OK. Um, so when you have the uh, honor of um, introducing a keynote speaker like Ruhi, you, you always try to find a unique way to present that person. And um, while thinking about it, it occurred to me that uh, this morning is all about the future of web and internet and possibly the impact of AI on that future. And therefore, 
uh, in the future, we could imagine um, that distinguished keynote pe pe uh, speaker would not be introduced like people, by people like me, but they may be introduced by digital assistant, such as the one Ruhi uh, creates. So in other words, to introduce the keynote speaker of this morning, who better than the smart speaker he helped create it? So, so right now in the room, a lot of people are saying, no, he's not doing a live demo in a plenary. He said, yes, he is. It's even worse because I am, I've been selected as a beta tester for the French version of Alexa, and that's it. Uh, so let's see, now I have to play with technology. Alexa? Hello. Good morning, Fabian. How are you doing? Uh, honestly? <laughs> A bit, a bit nervous. Um, so, but, but by the way, when, when you introduce a keynote speaker, a very good thing to do uh, is to engage the audience. And uh, one of the ways to do that is, is, is to make a joke. And this thing knows to make joke. Let's see. Alexa, tell me a joke. Why did the web developer go broke? Because he used up all his cash. <laughs> okay, the, the joke did work. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry, Wendy, Wendy, you'll have a whole panel to tell me about the, how sexist I was. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, but, but you must, give to me that it was a very appropriate joke for a web conference, wasn't it? Okay, um, Okay, let's be more serious. Uh, Alexa, what are you? I am Alexa, a digital assistant built into devices such as smart speakers. Good. Alex, um, Alexa, oops, I lost it, sorry. Let me reconnect again. Okay. Uh, Alexa, who is Ruhi Sarikaya? Ruhi Sarikaya is the director of applied science of the Amazon Alexa team. Ruhi and his team are building my brain and my capabilities around ranking, relevance, natural language understanding, dialogue management, contextual understanding, personalization, and end-to-end -end metrics. So you see, I, I better be looking for a new job soon because the digital assistant is doing a pretty good job. Alexa, what is his background? Prior to joining Amazon, Ruhi Sarakaya was a principal science manager and the founder of the Language Understanding and Dialogue Systems Group at Microsoft. His group has built language understanding and dialogue management capabilities of Cortana. Before Microsoft, Ruhi Sarakaya was a research staff member and team lead in the Human Language Technologies Group at IBM Watson. Okay, one last question. Alexa, what is his academic track? Ruhi Sarakaya received his BS degree in 1995 from Bilkin University, his MS degree in 1997 from Clemson University, and his PhD degree in 2001 from Duke University, all in electrical and computer engineering. Ruhi Sarakaya has published 120 technical papers in refereed journal and conference proceedings, and is inventor of over 70 issued and pending patents. Impressive. So, enough geek playing. And now to the real thing. Please join me in welcoming Ruhi Sarikaya for his talk.
All right. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks uh, for coming uh, this early. Uh, I'd like to thank the uh, conference committee and organizing committee for inviting me over here. It's a beautiful city, <laughs> beautiful uh, weather, uh, beautiful uh, venue. And uh, I think the team is uh, doing a fantastic job. The conference is running like a well-oiled machine. Uh, kudos to the team. All right. So, okay. Uh, I uh, structured my talk into the following sections. I will first talk about um, human interactions with the physical and the digital world. And I will talk about the fundamental interactions the frictions that, uh, that we face when we are interacting with digital devices, applications, and services. Then I will talk about uh, how conversational AI works in the case of Alexa. And uh, I will also provide some uh, solutions, uh, talk about the solutions to these fundamental frictions uh, using conversational AI. So uh, let's start with friction. You will hear this a lot throughout the talk. Uh, I looked up the dictionary. Uh, and altered the definition of friction uh, to target the problems that I will be talking about this morning. So friction is any variable that slows you down or entirely halts uh, the progression towards achieving a goal. This probably happened to many of you around holidays, say Christmas time, you bought a, a present for your kids or your family members and uh, they open the present only to find out that either the battery is missing or the cable is missing. And uh, this is a bummer. Uh, and since this happens around the holidays, all the stores are closed. Uh, and this is not just about physical goods and gadgets. This happens when you are uh, purchasing something online uh, from web services. There are overly complicated forms that you need to fill out and difficult to navigate menus. It creates aggravation. And uh, when this happens, you know, customers, they never blame them themselves or they try to figure out a solution. Instead, uh, they abandon your website uh, and they go uh, seek out the solution elsewhere, uh, your competitor. And according to the latest study, about 78% of the customers, they bailed out on a, tra on a transaction uh, and didn't do intended purchase because of these uh, customer frictions. And uh, by contrast, if uh, the friction is reduced, in a transaction, that creates a snowball effect. You know, imagine that you're coming here, you need a, a carry-on luggage, and you're visiting certain websites, and then you, know, you find a luggage, and right there it says that this luggage is suitable for carry-on, and if you order it now, you will get free shipping. And then you, you, it's a positive experience. You go tell this to your friends and uh, colleagues. So I was thinking about, you know, as you know, Amazon is uh, active in many different business segments, uh, and AWS, e-commerce, uh, um, even Amazon Studios and Alexa. So uh, you know, what does that Amazon really do? Uh, if you, you know, summarize it in two words, Amazon is in the business of removing friction. And one clicks shop is about removing friction. Uh, Amazon Prime is about removing friction and Amazon Go is about removing friction. I am in uh, Seattle, headquarter one, in day one building. Uh, from 25th floor, it takes me 90 seconds to go downstairs to Amazon Go stores, grab my lunch, and come upstairs. 90 seconds. So that's about removing friction. And Alexa is no exception. And removing friction is a key to customer satisfaction. Let me ask you a question at this point. So what is the... Uh, common thread or theme across these different types of frictions. Think about it. I think you will find the answer throughout the presentation. OK, so let's go to the basics. So how do we interact with the world around us, uh, physical or digital? So we have you know, our senses, sight, hearing, touch, smell, taste, and uh, sight, hearing, and touch. These are the primary ones. and. Uh, we perceive the world around us through our senses, and they are stored in different parts of our brain. So this is a simple computational model of human information processing. 
we get the input through our sensors, uh, and then we process this information, and then we generate an outcome or response. So in this uh, image, you know, the visual signal from uh, our retina is related uh, uh, to our uh, primary visual cortex in the back of our brain, and the sensory information is combined with memory, uh, knowledge, uh, reasoning uh, to come up with a response. And that response is uh, actuated through our motor skills, which is essentially controlling our uh, uh, muscles and limbs. In this case, you see a pedestrian crossing the road, and we hit the brake. And this whole thing takes about a quarter of a second. Now, how about computers? Computers do not have senses. Uh, they don't have sight. They don't have hearing, at least until recently. Uh, and they, they need to receive, uh, perceive the you know, environment, uh, and we uh, explicitly provide this input to them. And we do that through uh, typing, touching, and primarily using our hands. And if you go back, this is actually the first uh, computer, uh, it's called ENIAC, and this is accepted as the ancestors of modern day, modern day computers. And here, uh, Francis Bilas and uh, Betty Jennings are standing in front of its main control panel, and they're programming this machine. And there are about 40 panels and about 3,000 switches and hundreds of cables. So it took them a couple days just to uh, provide the input uh, for the types of tasks that this machine is supposed to do. And it took as many days to take it out. So it took you know, about a week just to do simple things that you would do probably in a minute with three lines of code right now. So I, I, want, I want you to specifically focus on the input part of uh, uh, the computers, that how uh, they've been getting input from us and how we have been providing input to them. So this is Apple One, and it's uh, built by Steve Wozniak in 1976 in the garage of Steve Jobs. And if you look at it, this is actually similar to the computers that we see today. It has a keyboard, it has a, a system unit, motherboard, and, and a screen monitor. And in 80s, we have IBM PCs. And in 90s, we have Windows desktop. With the invention of graphical user interface, we also added a mouse. Uh, you can scroll up and down, and you can click on the stuff. But still, you have still monitor, system unit, and you have a keyboard. And this is what you have today, where keyboard, uh, monitor, and the system unit are fused together. You have a single entity laptop that you are using. And right now, uh, the keyboard has disappeared. It became a software. You still use hands, uh, though, to maybe more touching and ty less typing, uh, more swiping and touching. But still, you know, the primary mode of providing input is your hands. And uh, the, the, the problem with this is, you know, when you look at it over the last 40 plus years, the computers are designed uh, primarily around the uh, tactile input. And it is not designed uh, receiving input uh, from other modalities like voice uh, or vision. So I will focus on the voice. And this is a problem. This is a problem because even though we have mobile phones, well, it's a computer that you go and you can use on the go, you take it wherever you go, but whenever you interact with it, uh, it binds you to the screen, it actually immobilizes you. And that's a friction that has to be removed moving forward. There is no good reason, actually, why you need to stop everything you do uh, just because you're interacting with the computer. All right, so th these are uh, Alexa devices that we uh, launched um, over the past couple of years. And uh, as you see, there's only one device, or two, two of them, that has a small a screen, and the rest is uh, headless. There is no screen. And there is not a single day that you hear uh, and read in the news uh, that goes by that you don't hear these types of news. And you may be wondering uh, and also trying to make sense of what is really happening. So um, I, will, I will provide my perspective on uh, what is happening here and maybe talk about the deep currents that are at play uh, beneath the surface. So let's start with intelligent personal assistance. And 
what is intel intelligent personal assistant? It is a meta layer of intelligence, and it sits on top of other uh, services and applications and performs actions uh, and serves uh, content and answers to fulfill the user's request. Uh, it also has natural language inter interface. Uh, this is actually a feature that the customers love, and we, we have done many research, and the customers love to interact with these devices through natural language. And it relies on a core set of technologies, capabilities like machine learning, AI, natural language understanding, uh, inference, and personalization. So these are, there are many uh, intelligent personal assistants in the market. These are the main ones. Siri was launched in 2011, and a year later, Google came up with Google Assistant. Cortana was launched in 2014, and later in the year, we launched uh, Amazon Alexa. And here's a real example. And uh, actually, I was traveling to Prague, uh, so I had this flight card uh, on my phone. I booked the, uh, this trip a couple weeks before, and this is at the day of travel. I get this uh, notification card telling me that my flight is, uh, is delayed. And when you think about it, you know, these are the steps that uh, uh, the machine, the uh, agent, had to go through. Uh, it scans my email, and it extracts the information, uh, and it stores it somewhere, the flight information, it stores it somewhere. And it computes my current location using the GPS on my phone and checks the traffic conditions to the airport and tells me whether I should leave for the airport or not. And also checks the f flight status and updates me with that information. And also, you know, here it knows that my target uh, destination is Prague, tells me uh, the weather in Prague and also the uh, 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 exchange rate between US dollar and Czech currency. These are the information that I need to uh, find out for my trip, but I have to use seven, eight different applications. And the promise of personal assistance is, you know, it can do these atomic steps behind the scene. It can stitch them together, and that provides a tremendous value uh, to the customers in removing the cognitive friction that you have to go through. Uh, the composing dif uh, the, uh, different tasks uh, and different steps uh, to get you an answer. Now, uh, I will uh, spend uh, five or uh, six minutes uh, and I take a detour, and this is and talk about you know the what's happening in this space during the past uh, 50, 60 years. This is a chart that you may have seen. This is uh, generated by Mary Meeker, who is a Wall Street uh, Journal analyst, ex Wall Street Wall Street Journal analyst, and she's an uh, investor right now. And I replied it here for you. So this is showing the uh, the. Uh, computing cycles that are taking place every 10 to 15 minutes. It started in uh, 60s with the mainframes in the basement of large corporations that you didn't know it existed. And fast forward to the 2000s where you had the desktop in, in your home and in your offices. Right now we are going through the mobile internet uh, uh, computing cycle. If you look at this graph, the y-axis is showing you the installed base. Uh, and uh, Basically, what it tells you that with every computing cycle, the installed base is growing by about 10x. Uh, uh, with the mobile internet, we have around 10 billion units uh, in circulation. And the next computing cycle is Internet of Things, and we expect it to have 100 billion uh, devices. When you think about it, it really makes sense. Today, you have, say, a few you know, computers, your uh, smartphone, uh, your tablet, and you, have, you may have a laptop at work at the home. You may probably have five, six devices. And, and uh, you know, starting now, uh, you will have uh, your uh, fridge, uh, your thermostat, your uh, lights. You will be able to interact with them through natural language and have them to do things uh, for you because any device with an internet connectivity will be a computer. So the definition of, co of computer is changing. And uh, that's what I said, the mobile phones are dominating the market right now. Now, I will bombard you with a set of charts. Uh, sit tight and bear with me for the, you know, a few minutes. And this is the global computing device, uh, device shipments in, in millions. And as you see here, the 
PCs are flat, uh, maybe slightly declining, not good news for Microsoft. Tablets were ri rising, but then with the f uh, uh, increasing the uh, size of the form factor for smartphones, that sort of got tamed. And the smartphones are, as you see, it's, uh, it increased quite a bit. And it's saturating, though. Uh, you know, they, uh, like this year in 2018, uh, uh, it's expected that 1.6 billion smartphones will be sold. And this is the global digital statistics. And uh, as of 2018, we have you know, 7.6 billion people in the world, and the unique mobile users are 5.1 billion. So when you think about it, uh, you know, anyone uh, who's older than 10 years old is, uh, could be a target market for smartphone. smartphone. And that's about 5.5 billion people. So it's expected that in about two years, uh, everyone in this target market will have a smartphone. So that means there's no growth <coughs> for connecting the people uh, through smartphones. But the big corporations uh, has to grow. So what is the next big growth opportunity? All right, so that was the devices. Now there are applications run running on these devices. And this is this chart is showing the applications in different app stores, primarily uh, Apple App Store and Google Play Store. As you see here, there is no sign of slowing down. There are over two million apps uh, in, in Apple App Store and over three million apps in Google Play Store. The trajectory is upwards, and this is showing the global app downloads in billions. The, uh, last year, there were about 180 billion apps downloaded. Again, if you look at the trajectory, it's going up. There's no sign of slowing down. And this chart is interesting. So this is showing you the app usage statistics, number of apps used per month, uh, and time spent each of these apps. If you look at it, the blue uh, chart here, that's fairly flat. You know. From 2001 to 2017, look, we use on average uh, about 30 apps in a month and nine apps in a day. Even though, as I said, developers are writing many more apps and uh, people are downloading apps at an increasing rate, and yet we are not actually using these apps. Why? So 80% <laughs> of these apps are called zombie apps, meaning that no one ever used them. So here is one app you probably didn't know that it existed. Uh, it's called P-Times. So <laughs> when you are in a movie theater and watching a movie and you need to pee, so you, you can download this app and this app will tell you that, you know, what is the best time to pee. So, <laughs> so human editors, they sit down, they watch the movie, they sit down and they annotate the movie. They're between you know, 12 minutes and 15 minutes, there's no action, you're not missing anything, you can safely go pee and come back. So, <laughs> so the, the point is, uh, you know, there are uh, many apps like this, which you may argue it's not useful. There are many thousands of, hundreds of thousands of apps that are very useful but you just don't know those apps. So app discovery is a challenge. It's actually a core challenge that we haven't cracked so far. So that's friction number one. The other problem is you know, uh, to figure out how these apps work. Say you are using Facebook app every day. So if I, you never used Facebook app and I give you the Facebook app, it will take you at least a couple hours or maybe a day actually to figure out how this application works. Now imagine that you have hundreds of thousands of these applications. You simply don't have the bandwidth. You don't have the you know, uh, time. You don't have the cognitive bandwidth to learn how these applications work. So that's friction number two. That's something that we haven't cracked either. Now, uh, let me ask you a question at this point. Uh, what is the most valuable asset you have during the day or any day? OK, you got the answer. Time. So <laughs> I will come to what 1,000 minutes is. So here's another chart. This is actually showing, uh, this is for US uh, households, US uh, people living in the United States. It's showing how we spent our time uh, between web, mobile devices, and TV. Something interesting happened around 2014 where the time we spent uh, in these mobile apps 
surpass the time that we are spending watching TV. And when you look at the, you know, from 2014 to 2010, uh, last four years, you will see there's about 110 minutes difference. Uh, and that where we are spending time in these applications. Uh, let's take a note of that. And these uh, applications are after you and your time. That's why, uh, what makes them valuable. And here, is, here are two charts. Uh, can you tell me the difference between these two? You have five seconds. Let me give you 10. No? Let me give you the answer. Six years. That's the difference. <laughs> well, uh, you know, remember in the previous uh, slide, I told you that there are you know, 110 minutes difference between 2010 and 2014. And if you look at this chart as if nothing has changed, you know, you know, we, we sleep, we work, we care for others, uh, we do household uh, chores, and nothing has changed in the last you know, six years. Uh, so the math doesn't add up. Uh, so, <laughs> 100, 1,000 minutes is your daily budget. If you leave out the sleeping time, uh, which is about 78 hours, that leaves you with 1,000 minutes. When you think about it, you need to work, you need to eat, you need to, as I said, you know, do shopping, uh, clean the house, take care of the kids, everything, it has to fit into 1,000 minutes. That's not a lot of time when you think about it. So what does that mean? Well, this is what happens. Uh, this is, uh, you know, you're having fun, so to speak, with your friends and colleagues. So the application apps penetrated anything, uh, everything, uh, whatever you do. And this is all too familiar scene, right? Maybe not. <laughs> so what this tells me is that you, know, you are well over your 1,000 minute budget and you need help. <laughs> you need help uh, for managing your life. And uh, this is what Alan Turing said, you know, one needs a machine to beat another machine. Intelligent personal assistance could be that machine that will give you your time back. At least this is the, uh, this is the promise. Now, uh, another uh, you know, uh, point here is the natural way to interact with the personal assistants uh, is the voice input. And the reason for that, there's actually a core reason for that. They, uh, when you look at these smart devices, you, know, you type, you touch, uh, they, uh, the information throughput to these devices would be four times faster if you speak to them as opposed to you type to these devices. And you realize that you're already doing this with the you know, improvements in, in technology, that whenever you see a box with the mic icon, you actually hit the mic and you start speaking as opposed to you know, uh, keep typing. And uh, the reason for that is you know, speech recognition improved quite a bit, and it's expected to replace touch and typing as the primary input form. Touch and typing will not go away, but I'm saying that it will be the primary input. And because of this, the big companies are recognizing it and they deep, uh, push deep, deeper into the platform for uh, Apple, uh, Microsoft, uh, Google. Uh, and there are several projections, and I've been keeping track of these. Actually, they're not off. Uh, they're conservative, and you know, in, in the next two, three years, all searches will be, 50% of searches will be voice-based. Um, and the, uh, deep learning had a huge impact on speech recognition accuracy. Uh, you know, uh, even the, there's a, you know, a task called switchboard uh, telephone speech recognition that I've been uh, following closely. Uh, uh, there's a competition between IBM and Microsoft. Uh, the, speech recognition systems uh, actually can outperform human on certain tasks which are very difficult. And Amazon Alexa is entirely voice driven and uh, uh, it, it, uh, customers are loving it and it, uh, it's adopted and the usage keeps increasing. So, you know, uh, now if we bring everything together that I said so far, so in about two years, three years, the uh, almost everyone will have a smartphone. 
and you spend over three hours in a day, and it's in still increasing on your smartphone. And Internet of Things is happening with no clear and effective way to interact with these uh, devices. And the frictions that we listed are application discovery, limited cognitive bandwidth uh, to learn how these applications work, and information flow into these small form factors and IoT devices. And the constraint is critical, that's your time budget, 1,000 minutes. So Alexa uh, aims to address these frictions through machine learning and AI, and it provides a layer uh, over applications and services to find the right skill, right task for you. And it can do it pro proactively without you asking, or it can do it reactively uh, based on your request. So now let's go back to how conversational AI works uh, in the case of Alexa. So when you say, you know, Fabian tried it here, <laughs> when you ask Alexa, what is the weather? So uh, there is a wake word detector running on the device. So unlike what people think, actually, not everything goes to cloud. Uh, uh, the engine running on the uh, and the device just list, uh, listens for the keyword Alexa. And when, once it hears Alexa, it starts streaming the audio to cloud. So that goes to the platform, and platform takes this utterance and send, sends it to speech recognition service. Uh, and speech recognition service returns the recognition results, it transcribes the speech, and the platform sends that to an LU service. Uh, and an LU service basically extracts the meaning uh, from the utterance, the, what is the user's intent, what are the entities that the user talked about. And, and after that, it finds the right, we call it skill, you call it domain, some others call it answers. These are basically the, the units that takes the NLU output and like as in the case of weather, you may call the accurate weather or something else to get the information that you want to serve to the user. And uh, that goes back to the platform and it also sends a speech directive, meaning that this is the weather in Lyon is, you know, 23 degrees and sunny. And the uh, directive is played, uh, first actually synthesized through text-to-speech synthesis, and then that's sent back to Alexa voice and you, you hear that uh, in the Echo device. So this is sort of the full path that you, you know, go through. Uh, of course, this is you know, simplified. Uh, the, the real systems are a lot more complex than this, but uh, you know, I think this gets the idea. Uh, all right, so this is, uh, you know, uh, we have, uh, as you know, we are building these capabilities to Alexa, but uh, uh, we have an open platform where if you, own a hardware or if you uh, uh, manufacture hardware, you can bring Alexa's uh, uh, speech recognition and natural language understanding capabilities to your device. And you do that through uh, Alexa voice services. These are a set of tools and APIs that you can use to bring Alexa's voice and intelligence to your, uh, you know, it's, it's even smart speakers. Other you know, companies are producing smart speakers similar to Echo. The other uh, side of this is Ask Alexa Skills Kit. <clears throat> In this case, you can, if you have a web service or you have a uh, use case, uh, you can actually bring that to Alexa. Uh, say you have your Domino's Pizza, you want you know, Alexa's customers to order pizza from you, you can actually build a skill within hours. And, uh, Alexa would be the endpoint. The customers can interact with your skill and you can take the orders. So uh, these are the two, it's fully open, as I said. Uh, you know, the number of skills are uh, growing day by day. And so now, uh, this is, you know, Alexa Brain is the team uh, I've been leading uh, at Amazon. And uh, our focus has been about removing natural language interaction frictions. Uh, so I will be talking about these uh, three circles here. We have actually a lot more circles, but uh, we are going to be making an announcement today. By the end of this talk, we are going to have a blog, blog post uh, talking about the features that I will be uh, talking here. And they related to uh, skill ranking and arbitration and uh, multi-turn dialogue, uh, contextual understanding, and memory and personalization. So, the first thing is, as I said, the interaction with the skills, uh, the uh, core uh, frictions that I mentioned. So we took this problem head on and uh, 
because Alexa is voice forward, uh, can we eliminate uh, or reduce at least uh, the app discovery? Uh, that the customers, they don't need to know uh, what application is right for their request. They don't need to know how sh they should interact with these applications. If you remove these devices, uh, I'm sorry, these hurdles, these frictions, all of a sudden you go from, you know, say 50 to 100 first party domains to 40,000 domains that the developers are uh, building and adding every day. So all you need to do as customer, just state your intent in your natural language and we will find the right skill for you and we will uh, get the answer from the skill and give you one shot answer. And that's the problem we took on. And uh, as I said, this is addressing the friction number one and friction number two uh, that I described earlier. And the other one is contextual understanding. You know, uh, most of these personal assistants are designed around single shot, single shot interactions. You ask them a question, you get an answer, you're done. And there are many tasks and scenarios that it requires multi-turn interaction. And uh, that's the ability to carry over the context from one turn to the other. So that's another announcement that I will be making. And that's another problem we took on, by the way. And the last one is, uh, Memory. So, you know, you interact with these uh, uh, assistants every day. They learn, they learn uh, not fast, you know. <laughs> so, because <laughs> uh, it's a long, you know, you get the data, you transcribe, you annotate, and then, you know, you update the models to sort of see the improvement, but at a slow pace. Can we, you know, we thought, can we actually add memory to Alexa so that it learns better? Uh, it learns faster, so it remembers things for you. So that, of course, there are different stages of this. We, we first started with, uh, let's, you know, if you ask Alexa explicitly to remember certain things, then Alexa should remember those. So that's the last feature uh, that we are announcing. And uh, as I said, by 9 a.m., uh, this should be live. Uh, <laughs> okay. Now, let me talk about the complexity of the problems. Th these aren't actually simple problems. Uh, uh, natural, skill, uh, natural language skill interaction challenges. So let me talk about the ambiguity first. So if I say, Alexa, what should I do for dinner? What do you think Alexa should understand? What is the user's intent? Well, you're hungry for one thing. All right. Well, you may be hungry, you may want to book a restaurant, you may want to order food, or you may want to find a recipe. It depends, right? If you're cooking at home a lot, you may, you know, Alexa, you expect Alexa to suggest your recipe. If you're ordering food a lot, you, uh, suggest, you expect Alexa to do something else. So it depends. It depends on the person. So here's another example. Uh, Alexa, find Hunger Games. Same, right? It could be playing a sound trail, or playing video, or playing audiobook, or buying an item. You don't know, right? And here's, this is interesting too, that you know, Alexa scheduled a package pickup for 6 p.m. For sure you know that this is UPS or, or FedEx, but which one? Right? It depends. Uh, it, de <laughs> it depends on your uh, time and location and also your zip code, because they may not serve your zip code if you're asking this at 6 p.m., you know, maybe FedEx handles it, not UPS. All right, so you sort of got the idea. Uh, so there is this uh, natural language ambiguity that you can't really tell what is the user's intent. You can sort of narrow it down, but you can't really tell what it is. So this is a problem that we need to deal with. The other one is, you know, with the third party skills, the current interaction model, there are exceptions to it. Uh, where we took the path of how uh, quickly we can integrate, integrate these third-party applications to Alexa. And the model that we choose, it worked very well, by the way. We have over 40,000 skills right now. Uh, you can integrate the third-party experiences to Alexa, skills to Alexa, by saying, Alexa, ask X to do Y. So there's a strict pattern there, the phrase, uh, uh, Alexa, ask X, that sort of uh, handles the ambiguity I'm talking about. You actually narrow it down to one specific skill. That's Alexa ask X. Uh, and then Y is the payload that the skill needs to understand and uh, come up with an action. And uh, the problem is, you know, this is not natural. This is not natural. Alexa, how is the weather? I don't need this Alexa ask blah, you know, to, to tell me the weather. And 
uh, we did a study internally and we found out that 81% uh, of the low skill usage, low skill usage with respect to first party domains, uh, are attributed to uh, interaction with the skills, the skill discovery, awareness, and uh, frictions around invocation and, and recall. And this is an example that actually with this announcement that I made, this is what will happen. So when you ask you know, Alexa, Alexa, how can I remove the oil stain? And the, uh, for the first time, uh, Alexa will find the right skill and tell you that Tide Stain Remover can help you with that. We want to enable it. We, will, we want the customer's consent uh, to enable the skill. And the customer says, yes, please. And the second time you use it is uh, you know, the, for the same utterance. Alexa, how can I remove oil stain from my shirt? This time, Alexa will tell you, OK, Tide Stain Remover will help you with that and we hand it over to Tide Stain Remover. In one shot, you get the answer to your question. There's no multi-turn step. Uh, this is actually foundational when you think about it, uh, and the number of skills are uh, growing, and you will be able to interact with these skills in a natural way. All right, so this is a, now I'm talking about the solutions, the more on the science side of what we have done. And uh, this, uh, this is the high-level architecture of the system that, uh, uh, we have in Alexa, and these the green boxes are the new components that we introduced. And we introduced the uh, uh, NLU shortlister, and I will talk about what it does, and we also introduced the contextual ranking. So uh, this is the uh, NLU shortlister. Uh, when, you know, if you think about the ambiguity that I talked about, you know, Alexa, what should I do for dinner? So there, are not a, there is not a single skill that will answer this question. So what we, an LD short test does is what are the, for this utterance, what are the likely uh, skills or domains that can answer this question? And when we designed the solution, uh, there were a few factors that we had to keep in mind. And one of them is, you know, the number of skills are uh, increasing every day. It's 40,000, maybe 100,000, 200,000 in the next year or two. So the architecture should be able to handle that scale. That's one. The other one is, uh, you know, there are new skills added. So each time we, sh we shouldn't go and uh, retrain the whole thing. These are more practical things, but they're important if you're running a production system. Uh, you should be able to add these skills uh, incrementally without re re rebuilding the whole system. The other constraint is uh, the memory and foot, uh, memory usage and footprint. We should be able to minimize uh, the memory required for adding a new skill. So when we, when we th and also accuracy is you know, something that we optimize all the time. So when we uh, thought about all these factors, this is the architecture that we came up. So we take an utterance and uh, we, this is a bidirectional LSTM at character level and word level. Uh, the, the box that you see here the, um, uh, is, is essentially does the uh, utterance embedding using the characters and the words in the sentence. And this is largely skill or, or domain in, independent. And this embedding comes up with this green units that you see here, say in 200 dimensional uh, vector. And we take this vector, and on the left side, you see the you know, skill enablement. This is person, personalization information. It's actually more than this, but we are just looking at the skill enablement as personalization signals here. Customer A you know, enabled skill you know, A, B, C, some other customer enabled some other set of skills. So we use these, this information in, uh, when we are shortlisting uh, the skills, because if the customer enables these skills, that's a strong signal. And we you do that through uh, attention mechanism and also as uh, personalization signal uh, 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 before uh, we do the, uh, uh, rather the classification for the skills. We take the uh, embedded uh, uh, utterance embedding, we combine it with the uh, skill uh, uh, signal and also attention over the skills, and then we uh, here, what you see at the top is, these are per skill feed forward layers. So it's binary, it's yes or no. And uh, the, as I said, the dimension of this vector is the embedding vector is 200. So 200 by 200, that's about 400 parameters per skill that you need to learn. And when you do the math, actually, you can have hundreds of thousands of skills and you can be still within the memory limits of a GPU. All right. 
So this is something that, you know, we published this. Actually, it's just uh, got accepted two weeks ago. We heard that it's a paper that you will see it in, uh, in ACL. It's a long paper. So these are the results uh, that uh, you will see. There are more results in the paper. So what we took 1,500 skills uh, 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 for experimentation. And uh, we run, looked at a bunch of different models and model architectures. And binary is, you know, if you train a separate model per, for each skill, these are the set of results that we have looking at top one, top three, or top five uh, best results. And you multitask, multi-classes, you go, you know, you still do the embedding, but do the classification, uh, NVA classification at the top layer. And multitask is uh, uh, you do, uh, you know, uh, you still do the embedding, but instead of multitask classification, you classify each skill independently. And one bit flag is this personalization signal, whether this uh, skill is enabled or not. We add attention to it. So the takeaway take away message here is, let me get to it. So when you do sentence embedding, that's multitask, you get better results. And if you add the personalization signals, of both you know, as a, a bit uh, and also attention, you get further uh, improvements uh, in the results. And the, uh, yeah, looking at the model training side, uh, this was important also, as I said, if you train a binary model, it takes four, uh, 34 seconds. Uh, and expand is what we are trying to do here is, you, know, you already trained a base model and now you are adding skills incrementally. That's what we are looking at, and we are looking at the training time. And adding a new skill, you just add a new skill in 30 seconds. And if you do complete refresh of the models, it takes you know, about two orders or more uh, time uh, to train the whole thing. The accuracy is, as you see, uh, not different, expanding uh, versus refresh. Okay, I covered that. So this is the contextual ranking part. It's two-stage ranking. Short, we shortlist, we, go, we run an LU intent recognition and entity recognition and entity resolution. Then we do final ranking, which takes all the contextual signals that we have uh, about the session, about the user, about the device, and then do, we do final ranking. And here, you know, the user said, play Michael Jackson, that we shortlist that these are the classical music, pop music, whether these are the likely you know, domains that can answer this question. We run any other, uh, an intent classification. Then, as I said, the hype, uh, hypo we generate the hypothesis that that would be ranked. So if we look at this box here. So what we did here is, you know, we generated these hypotheses, these all embedding, this is again, uh, uh, LSTM. Uh, and uh, we tried to model the dependencies and structure between these different hypotheses uh, in the shortlisted uh, 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 skills. And th these are the results. So the, here, what you see, uh, the first line is if you're looking at just a uh, uh, shortlisted output, which is non-personalized. Small scale is typically this is what people have been doing and reporting numbers in the, in the community. And there's, you know, we are going to 1,500 skills here. Of course, because of the ambiguity, the accuracy drops from 95 to uh, 81. And then uh, when you do the hypothesis ranking, uh, you know, as I said, getting this contextual signals, you can get to 85 and 95. And then when you model the dependencies between the different hypotheses, you get to 97 and 93. And here, LSTM CH is, this is if you, you know, uh, manually alter some of these features, and uh, you, you get something similar. Well, the point here is you can actually learn these uh, dependencies and these features. You don't need to manually alter any, any feature. And okay, so the other problem that we looked at is, uh, and this is also, is a, this is actually coming out in Knuckle, also the two papers. Um, and contextual carryover uh, and resolution. So this is about carrying over intents and slots across uh, user turns and system turns. This can be within domain or cross domain. So slot carryover example here is, you know, user said, Alexa, how many minutes? Three, Three. okay. This is actually last two slides, okay. The, uh, yeah, so it's a multi-turn interaction. There's a user turn, there's a system turn, there are uh, slots and entities in different turns. Can we actually carry over or drop this information so that we can accurately answer the user's question? So uh, this is 
we lost it. Okay, this is the example. Here is you know Alexa. How is my uh, Alexa? How is the weather in Seattle? The next turn is Alexa. How is uh, how about this weekend? Alexa, how is my schedule? How about this weekend? The same address, second turn. You shouldn't give the same answer because the first turn is different. And the challenge here is each of these domains they don't share the same schema. They mean different things for you know for the same entities. So. In order to solve this problem, we came up with, uh, again, an, uh, uh, another LSTM-based architecture. It's basically looking at the user uh, utterances, system utterances, and we try to find the right uh, slots and how to fill them, given everything that we know. And I can go skip uh, that, too. So we run you know, some experiments. Basically, what, what this is showing is you know, we can, uh, using decoder and coder uh, LSTM network, we can uh, get pretty good results. And it's also within domain carryover is a lot easier compared to cross domain carryover. Those are the key observations. And Alexa memory is, this is, as I said, you, Alexa will remember things for you so that you don't need to remember. So you can say, Alexa, remember that, you know, uh, like Julie's birthday is July 2nd, and Alexa, I gave my nephew a Batman logo for his birthday. And when you ask, there is a retrieval part, you can ask Alexa to retrieve these memories. Um, so I think the point here is, uh, in your household, okay, where is the car keys, you know, where is the passport? Instead of asking this to your spouse, you will ask Alexa. Uh, did, you, did you check with Alexa first? <laughs> That's where you want to get to. <laughs> and these are sort of the numbers that we have uh, on this experimentation. So, okay, these are, I will leave you, no, no maybe, yeah. These, still, you know, uh, we haven't solved all these problems. There are speech recognition problems, arbitration problems, scaling issues, end-to-end -end metrics, uh, measuring these experiences. Uh, I'd like to end with, uh, with this slide on a positive note. Uh, it's, it's still early days, and we are really scratching the surface. Uh, and I'm very excited about the future, as we say it at Amazon. It's still day one. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ruhi. Please have a seat on the panel. So thank you very much, Ruhi. Uh, thank you for this really nice keynote. And um, so now to join you, I would like to call on stage uh, all the participants of the panel. That is Sir Tim Berners-Lee from MIT and W3C, Antoine Bordes for the uh, leader of the uh, Lab of Facebook Artificial Intelligence in Paris, Vinton Cerf, Vice President and Chief Internet Evangelist for Google, Kira Radinsky, di Director of Data Science at eBay and Visiting uh, Professor at Technion, and to chair that panel, Professor Dam Wendy from, uh, Dam Wendy Hall from Southampton University. And I will also be monitoring your tweets on reaction online. So do I have the mic? Oh, good. <laughs> I like having the mic. <laughs> um, uh, we, right, so hello, everybody. Uh, brilliant keynote, Rui. Uh, um, lots we could ask about that. And we've, we've really come up here to be the the Q&A for your, uh, your keynote. Um, I don't want to say too much. I was very excited when the Leon team decided to put this panel on. We have a few relatively well-known people on it. And uh, I'm sure you want to hear from them more than me. Um, AI is, uh, as we're in about the fourth hype wave of it, but it's really beginning to hit the development of systems. My friend on the right here neatly picked up the point about bias in the, and actually there was some bias in your stuff too, right? This, uh, you know, how biased is Alexa? Um, these are major issues as we go forward, and of course, all of this uses as the infrastructure to deliver. I've been up behind all of this are these standards and protocols that have been developed on the web and the internet. Um, and the amazing research that's going on on top of that is leading to these, you pointed to the Internet of Things. We are building a very complicated world that is going to be run using AI, and we have to think about the implications of that. So um, you have the uh, list of panelists. Uh, you have their bios on the web. We don't have time to go through all that. They're all wonderful. It's fantastic to have you here. 
Um, and uh, we, we've decided an order running actually is the same as, as we have on the website. Um, so we're going to start with Sir Tim. Young Tim, as I used to call him. Tim, you're up. You've got, I've asked all the panelists to make an opening statement of a, no more than five minutes. So the, a hook will appear, due, a Monty Python style, if you go o too much over that. We'll go through the statements and then try and, and open up to the audience. Uh, all yours now, you Tim. You have this, uh, all these various chairing techniques, such as only giving the whole panel one mic. So, well, <laughs> so one this here. is the token. OK. Uh, uh, so. Uh, so, okay, disclaimers, I'm not an AI expert, they put me on this panel, but... Uh, you're, you're a bit of a web expert. But I can, must say that the Web Foundation, for example, which tries to make sure that the web uh, serves humanity, has suddenly, uh, a couple of years ago, uh, 2016, uh, I think a lot of people I know, maybe a lot of people in this room, switched their attitude from thinking, imagining that if we make the, the web just free of royalties and open and neutral, then people will do great things on it. Everything will be, uh, will be like the, the positive side of Reddit. Everything will be like Wikipedia and so on. And we realized that actually what things that happened in 2016 means that you could build a system with the best intent and it can end up producing uh, all kinds of emergent phenomena phenomena that, that, that you can't, that, that you didn't, uh, ex that people who built it didn't expect. We found uh, mixtures of things. We found systems which were built, um, have been built with good intent, ending up producing emergent phenomena. Like, for example, the whole so social network world tends to polarize people. Uh, lots of great tracks on that, this uh, uh, conference, for example, lots of web science. We actually started you know, ten year, more than 10 years ago. We started talking about web science because we were worried about this. And when yes. people now say, hey, Tim, did you ever imagine that anything uh, like all the Facebook uh, stuff could happen? I said, yeah. <laughs> yeah, we started a whole, d <laughs> a whole science we have. Uh, and we have a... And we have a um, no, and, uh, now... Um, we have we, web science is a thing. You can go to the web science conferences and the web science proceedings. And the best paper at the, web, at the first web science conference was, in fact, about a Twitter bomb taking down Martha Coakley. Uh, in a, a, you know, so, so actually, yes, people have been thinking about this, but they didn't anticipate two years ago. Uh, but, we did, but clearly, yeah, we do have to not assume that the, the wonderful things have happened. The Web Foundation is very concerned, for example, about... Uh, AI, about bias in AI, about uh, implicit and explicit bias, uh, not just about uh, programmed, uh, but discovered, about how you know, your AI, which is de deciding whether to give uh, mortgages out to people or not, can discover the concept of a black person all by itself, for, for example. So there are these categories of things where we have to be careful about AI. It's, there, are, there, are, uh, there, are, there are the times when the AI has been designed very uh, uh, with the best of intention, and it ends up producing what we would call a bad effect. There are the times when it has been designed with bad intentions, or there may be times when it has been designed with just commercial intentions. So, for example, the interest, the the phenomenon where these guys in uh, Venice, Macedonia, were uh, just trying to make a living by just making web pages during the run-up to the turn to. Uh, to the Trump election, they were using Google ads to make their living, and Google ads trained them, gave them, just like dopamine drops, gave them money every time they made a website, they made the website more attractive to people, as they increased the click-through and age, and so Google ad machine trained these people who were not being malicious, they're just being commercial, trained them to put in lies, because lies have a better click-through, uh, who knew? Now we all know that eyes have a better click through. So the combination of, so that when you look at the uh, things coming down the road that we have to be careful of, all these combinations of things, uh, uh, and I haven't even talked about people you know, building the AIs maliciously, deliberately. I think we still have, uh, 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 and the, uh, you know, uh, we've also seen system, complex systems being invaded by malevolent powers. So lots of, this is a huge, broad question. I've given, uh, uh, all I've done is give you a little taxonomy of some of the issues, issues to think about. 
but uh, we are in a time of great concern. Tim, before you hand the mic to Vint, you and I, and all, many of us here, talk to government a lot. What's the role of government in this, do you think, in terms of how we regulate or don't regulate for the future with this, with AI? I think actually I'm sort of privacy regulation is, for me, is something which is a good idea. So things like GPDR, I think maybe the US will eventually get, get around to realizing that what it should do is sort of other countries should more or less copy GPDR, so privacy regulation sort of thing is. But uh, when it comes to regulating AI, it's much, uh, I mean, no, I can't just add that, throw that in on it. Uh, I think if you could, uh, if you could just create a form of regulation that would uh, require social networks to uh, reduce the polarization in society, well, that would be nifty. Then that would be a slam dunk. But it's, uh, but you know, we have experts in this conference about measuring that sort of thing. About and we have experts about figuring out whether, in fact, there's causality uh, or not between or which you know. Uh, but actually, but where when some of the real damages are things like the polarization. Uh, the, trans the, the fact that your, your so social networks ends up transmitting hatred more uh, than it tends to transmit love, then uh, that is a that's a hard thing to go out and, de and define let alone and regulate. Of course, we had a great keynote from Luciano yesterday on that. So now we're going to hand over to uh, to young Vint Cerf there <laughs> for his thoughts on this huge topic. Well, thank you very much. Uh, Ruhi, that was an absolutely spectacular keynote. I mean, a terrifically clear, cogent, um, very impressive. No, no wonder Alexa is doing as well as she seems to be doing. Uh, several comments. First one is that artificial intelligence, general AI, is not the same as machine learning. We shouldn't confuse the two. Machine learning is a narrower capability, but a very powerful one. Uh, if we want to be worried about things, if you want to go away being concerned, you should worry not so much about AI and machine learning, you should worry about autonomous software. That is to say, software that just runs without your intervention. The Internet of Things is going to be filled with such software. There will be bugs in the software, and mistakes will be made, and sometimes they will be consequential. So if you're worried uh, about uh, anything, you should be worried about the autonomous software that's running uh, all the various devices that surround us as the decades unfold. Um, one of the most powerful and important distinctions between human beings and uh, computer artificial intelligence is the ability to create models. That's what we do all the time. We observe the real world, we interact with it, we build models in our head, and then we act upon the models more than we act upon the uh, literals, so to speak, in the real world. And so what, uh, what Ruhi has uh, described for you, in a sense, is an example of a modeling capability. It's somewhat uh, manually constructed to some extent. When you create a skill, you are, in, in fact, generating a model upon which to act or about which to reason. And uh, so in a sense, uh, what I think uh, Ruhi has exposed uh, is a kind of spreadsheet, a cognitive spreadsheet for uh, programming artificial intelligence. And by exposing the interfaces to that uh, programmable uh, skill set, uh, I think that's actually a very good model. People who were not programmers learned how to write code in spreadsheets. And you ended up with quite a wide range of spreadsheet functionality, and that's exactly what I think is going to happen. With, uh, with what Alexa and uh, the Google Assistant and others uh, are beginning to experience. So uh, I think there's a very important abstraction for us to take away from uh, this morning's um, uh, keynote talk. Uh, I am actually a little concerned, however, about this focus of attention on voiced interfaces. And the reason for this is that I'm imagining a room full of students uh, trying to take notes without a keyboard. And so now they are you know, talking constantly and the noise pollution level goes up and the recognition rate goes down because of the noise pollution. I think we're going to have to think a little bit more carefully about exactly what uh, voice interaction is going to mean. Um, just a few other things and then uh, we should go on to other uh, panelists. Uh, Ruti right, uh, correctly mentioned the reduction of friction 
uh, was a very important way of measuring the success of the uh, work that you're doing. And I think this is a very good metric. Uh, peculiarly, uh, what Tim just mentioned, though, is that we have an environment where polarization is increasing rather than decreasing. And I would argue that polarization is, in fact, a major kind of, it creates friction. So we now have a very odd tension before us, which is the technologies that you and we here on the panel and others not in this room have developed are simultaneously uh, creating friction and attempting to reduce it. And this is going to be the conundrum, uh, certainly for the next decade. Madam Chairman, I turn the, the well, control over Well, I'm going to throw the same sort of question at you. I, we see all the governments around the world um, putting money into this space in order to try and grab the winnings. Um, and, you know, the media portray it as a, AI as a, as a race of arms between the US and China, but we have the French and the British currently deciding who can put the most money into AI. The Canadians were way ahead of us. Um, the governments ask you for your advice all the time. As I said to Tim, where, what's the role for government in um, if they're, if they're de helping develop companies uh, building AI uh, technology? Um, what's the role for them in trying to ensure that that's being used for the good and uh, not for the bad? So the short answer, of course, is we're doomed. Um, I think the real answer, though, is that we need to uh, imbue our uh, software developers, our artificial intelligence and machine language developers with a real sense of ethics. And this needs to be uh, taught in the earliest stages of education. So this sense of ethics and about the side effects of the tools that we develop I think is probably a more powerful measure to take than simply attempting to regulate. Mm. This is not easy. I mean, deciding what the ethics are is, uh, is going to be uh, debated uh, very heavily. There are uh, organizations like PAIR, which is a P P -A -I -R, which is organized around several companies, including Google, that are uh, concerned about and interested in applications for AI. But I would, I would urge governments not to leap too quickly into trying to assert uh, regulatory control because I think we don't even understand yet what kinds of controls we could effectively uh, engage. And until we have a deeper understanding of that, I don't think we want to stifle some of the creativity that these tools are, are offering. At the same time, uh, we ought to be conscious of the potential hazards. Yes, now that's a lovely launching point to move into the, the people from uh, the big Silicon Valley companies who are at the cutting edge of these developments. And so, you know, you have a, your fut our future in your hands, guys. Um, and of course, Facebook has been a little bit in the news lately, just a little <laughs> bit in this area. Um, uh, Antoine, um, let's have your thoughts on this topic. Thank you. Um, thank you for the, the invitation, the introduction. Um, very happy, uh, uh, very f proud to be here, actually. Um, so uh, I, I share a lot of the things that have been said before. Uh, and uh, in, 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 in Facebook and at Facebook, we also uh, try to engage in this. Uh, I think the, the issue has been raised around like uh, polarization or hate speech already. I mean, we're, we've been working on it for a while. It's been like uh, exploding in the news uh, in recent events, but it's something that actually we detected and we tried to work on, um, and we tried to address and put a lot of efforts on. Uh, something that we are uh, really committed to doing is uh, doing the research in the open, and I think this is something that's very important, in t especially when we do talk about regulation, talk about potential impact, talk about like potential changes. Uh, I agree with what Vinton said, uh, just like we don't necessarily know what kind of application are going to come out. And so what's very important at this stage is also to be as open as possible in terms of what are the capabilities of uh, AI algorithm, okay, learning or not. Uh, so that's why uh, at Facebook AI Research, which is the, the branch that I'm, I'm leading in France, uh, we open source all the code uh, and publish all the paper, all the stuff that we're doing. So that basically, there is no surprise in terms of the capability of the machine. 
uh, what, how, horrible, how good are they at understanding speech, how good are they at understanding language, or how bad, actually. This is actually a bit the, the problem. Um, looking at images, understanding videos, this kind of stuff. We try to basically be as open as possible in terms of, okay, this is what the machine can be doing. And the open sourcing uh, is very important in this because people can actually take the code, use it, try it themselves, and also help us to basically see what can be the weaknesses of this. Um, talking about uh, the, the bias uh, what, and, and also the ethics of the training, I think, uh, of, the, of the people in the community, uh, something that's been emerging uh, very recently. I mean, all this is very, very sudden. All this, all this is happening very fast. I mean, the, the, the impact of AI in the technology, uh, even though AI capabilities themselves, the core technology, have not been tremendously better uh, in terms of what a machine can do in terms of understanding the world in the last 10 years. We see like slow, in, slow increase. I mean, we're getting better, and the, the keynote was actually showing this. We, ca we are getting better at understanding small pieces. But you look, I mean, the, the new advances announced by Rui just before are just like, we're trying to have a machine that can remember the birthday of someone. Okay, so that's, and that's already challenging, and it, it was not possible before. So, but it, you know, if you go that and try to understand what can make people polarized, or can argue, can, I mean, you see the, the, the very big uh, road we have ahead of us. Uh, that said, I think uh, people in the community, uh, in AI in particular, are, start, are realizing now the impact that they have on people's life, which was not, I think, something that was the case like five or 10 years ago. And so, uh, we, there are two things for, to that, uh, ethical training for in data science masters, even in internal companies like Facebook and I guess others, are emerging, uh, which, was, which is completely new. And I think, the, which means that in the next few years, I think people will have much a better sense about how the impact of what they do is going to be on society, first of all, or at least try to have this in mind. And the second aspect is that all the aspect around like, trying to gaming and AI, uh, trying to, uh, to play AI, trying to, to use adversarial attacks against AI, uh, the bias in algorithm are actually becoming like research topics by themselves, which means that the community, and there is even this new conference called FATE, uh, I think it's Fairness, Accountability and Transparency uh, in AI, I think that's the name. The first one was in New York four years, four months ago. And so uh, basically the, not four years, yeah. Uh, uh, the, the whole issue actually, uh, and so, and everybody, the whole community is participating in these this events. Uh, and try to engage and publishing as well on this topic. So that's so why I think people are, are really uh, on the issue and uh, trying to work on it. Okay, so I'm going to ask you about privacy that Tim brought up. Obviously, this is a big thing about how you handle people's private data, which has been in the news so much lately. And GDPR is coming out a month today almost. Um, how's Facebook dealing with the issue of the new European regulation. Yeah. I knew she was going to ask this. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and, and I get it, not you. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, we've been working for GDPR for two years. So the uh, being very, and we are, we are going to communicate a lot in the coming months about how we're addressing that and what we are putting. The recent news have been basically moving a bit uh, ahead of time, the, the calendar, a lot of the things that have been announced in the last three weeks in terms of how people can actually access their data more easily, how people can have better transparency of what Facebook has, in terms of how they can actually uh, delete what Facebook has. Uh, this, this was actually, we were able to put these tools uh, right away after all the, the press cycle for the last like three weeks because they were actually being prepared for GDPR. So everything is, uh, is prepared so that basically people can have trust on the way uh, Facebook is handling data, and uh, and we are willing to, uh, to to be even more transparent as we were doing. We are being. But I you're think. a global company, and GDPR is a re European regulation. Yeah. So how is that going to work? Yeah. So GDPR is going to be applied for all the people in the European Union. Okay, the user, because that's the legislation. Um, Mark Zuckerberg. So that's actually getting in, in big, like. Uh, uh, in, uh, in, in bigger uh, things that I can discuss, but I mean, basically Mark Zuckerberg said that it might not be possible that we apply like GDPR for everybody at Facebook uh, eventually. That's what he said in the press, so uh, I trust him on that, but this is not in my power 
Because no, you said I understand this. that. Okay. Forgive, as Vince said, I <laughs> so, was bound uh, yeah, to I mean, ask you that because, you know, we hear stories of fault code and, um, you know, that it, how is how is it, sorry, we need to move on, I should, but I, I'm, I'm interested to think about how the whole, how it's going to develop. We have a big world, we have a US, we have a Europe, we have a China, we have a Russia, all doing different things, and, and it's a mess. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So. but uh, it seems that Europe is a bit uh, getting back in the in the game right now. Well, like yeah, and maybe for the good, as Tim said. But and, but well, we will we will see how this unfolds. So we're now going to move on. Thank you, uh, Antoine, um, uh, Kira um, Radiski. eBay was in the news this morning, actually. Well, actually, all the companies are in the BB, on the, BB, the news sites about how you're all doing and making money out of all our data. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Kira, would you like to give us your thoughts on the future of AI and the Internet and the web? Definitely. I'll start with the story, actually. I read uh, just a few weeks ago, so Tesla was talking about autonomous cars, and they were saying that each and every one of us is going to become a professional labeler mm. for the machine learning algorithm. <laughs> each one is going to be training their machine so the other machines can actually benefit from this. And when we talk about what's very new today around machine learning is the era of machines teaching machines. When I think about the new web, I think about millions of different machine learning algorithms acquiring data in different fields, understanding which fields they can actually collect data from, learning from it, and teaching others. And we've already been seeing success with this type of methods with AlphaGo when winning different games. But the idea of a machine understanding which information other machines need to train them is super important, and I think we're already getting there. Connecting all of them into a full change can actually create new interactions, new algorithms that we didn't expect. So in eBay, we have billion and a half products, but it's still not infinite. So what we were thinking about, how can we create algorithms that are going to create new types of products? So we started using different machine learning algorithms, using the same guns as everybody's using, creating a new image of a new dress, of a new bag. I thought I'd have noticed something. First of all, some of the clothes are actually really nice. I would wear them myself. But some of them had a problem. They actually don't fit a human being. <laughs> that can maybe fit a horse, me, maybe an alien. And that's exactly the problem that we see a lot of machine learning. If you think about the last two waves of machine learning that we've seen, the first one was using knowledge. There's an interesting story about a Dutch company that were actually trying to create rules for uh, couples who want to get married or divorced, asking them what they agree upon, what they don't agree upon, and then actually telling them exactly which uh, law they uh, uh, need to do, which agreement, etc. But they couldn't handle the really weird cases. And this is where the second wave came in of statistical machine learning, of doing some type of abstractions. But as we talked before, is well, who knows what's going on inside? So in the last two years, we've been talking about explainability, trying to make the algorithms explainable, but that's never going to be working well. And the reason for this is that algorithms just do not understand the world. They don't understand the physical constraints that we do. G is a really interesting uh, concept uh, in the field of IoT. For each one of their sensors, they have a simulator because they understand the physics of how it works. If you think about it, this is actually a Turing complete problem. They have code running of the simulator itself. Even if it's machine learning, it's still bound to the physical simulator. We as humans gave it data about how the world works via code. So I think this one is the third wave, us being able to give our knowledge, our physical knowledge of the world, which machine learning doesn't have, via simulators. I've been working uh, around healthcare in the, in the last few years through my academic position. We've been trying to understand EKG classification. We were trying to create actual EKG signals, but again, they were sometimes created in a completely wrong way, not looking like EKGs. The moment we started using hard simulators, eventually it's a very simple problem, it's just a pump. It actually started looking much better and improving a lot of the machine learning problems that we have. So this is the third wave, actually giving full understanding of how the world works to the machine learning. And for your last comment about actually manifesting data and how economy is going to change about this, and this is going to be my personal view, not the eBay's point of view, I think we see uh, a lot of changes today in cryptocurrencies. And the idea there is actually the distribution and understanding who owns the data. I think we're going to see 
with time, maybe in the next, not in the next five years, is data as currency. I believe that we own the data, as actually, as you've seen so much in the cryptocurrency world, and trading with your data is gonna be the next universal coin that we're gonna start using. So the companies won't be owning this because I own this. If I want to give it to the company, I get the service for this. And this is where you're gonna get full control, and this is probably the way, something we need to decide not only in Europe, not only in China, but actually all around the world. You have a very responsible, yes. You have a very responsible job being director of data science at eBay, and you must be at the forefront of all the privacy issues at eBay, and, um, and also the accountability issues that the governments are beginning to think about. Uh, uh, Antoine talked about open source research, but um, you know, uh, how do you uh, approach um, the development of algorithms uh, in, a, in, a, in a transparent way uh, in a big company like yours? Or anyone's. So I think this is something that many of the big companies are actually aligned to. We actually open source a lot of the things we do, the algorithms, and I think this is the uh, academic notion that we have in uh, all those uh, companies as well. What we publish in eBay as well is our data. Our data is public. We don't publish, of course, the user data, what people are buying, but we, you completely see our catalog. Again, a huge catalog of what people are thinking of selling how they're describing this, which images are they actually uploading. And what we understood in eBay is that if we want to understand commerce, we actually need to enable our users. And to enable is meaning better explanations of what this product is, what the value, and the most important thing, what is the fair price? It turns out that uh, a fair economy has to have uh, a notion of transparency of all the prices and what is fair. And this is exactly what we're trying to understand algorithmically. We're trying to understand the market not only in eBay, but also externally, build algorithms that actually try to understand what is the fair price. More than that, we in eBay are even willing to sponsor the difference so users will buy it at the right price because we think that if they benefit, we benefit. So, Rui. You have the la first and the last word. <laughs> no, or not. I mean, this isn't, we're going to go out to Q and A and other interactions. But um, wonderful keynote. You've heard what your other panelists are saying. How would you like to come back with comments about particularly this, the AI and the future? Sure. Uh, I have a few uh, points that I like to make. I hope I don't forget them. <laughs> One is, uh, I think the you know what uh, we are going to have with AI is. There's this, this secular trends that the you know the amount of data that we are generating is accelerating, and uh, there are different devices, different surfaces. We are sort of leaving our traces, and the pr problem is we cannot process this data. We cannot actually uh, get insight into this data without machine learning. I was reading uh, somewhere that uh, every year there's about 160,000 papers published on cancer. So if you're, a, if you're a cancer researcher, that will take about 10 years just to read uh, all the papers in, the, in your area. You simply can't do it. And uh, this is actually happening not in, specific, in one area, it's happening in all areas. So given that you need help, and AI is actually the help that you will get, you know, looking a uh, tremendous amount of data, uh, pulling inside, drawing inside, and uh, making it, a, uh, uh, presenting it to you uh, in a way that you can consume. So this is one thing. The other thing is with AI, I think the, if I you know, uh, look at it uh, and simplify it, AI is really simplifying uh, and reducing the cost of prediction. Prediction is very expensive. It takes expertise, it takes a lot of time, and if you, reduce the cost of AI uh, prediction and bring it to masses, that will, be, that will have a profound impact on the society, on different industries. This is what you're reading and seeing in agriculture and finance and medicine. And uh, there is no escape from it, and we need to embrace it. That's how I look at it. I think the government putting regulations, we should be a bit more careful. I think uh, maybe Wint uh, uh, was alluding to that. It, it, there has to be oxygen. For, for this to you know, uh, grow and flourish, if you squeeze that early on, that may actually limit the innovation. So that's something to watch out. It's still early days. 
I was just going to make a point, then I'll hand back to Vint, that um, uh, you, you, you talked about how we need machines to help us read all the papers out there, and of course they've helped us generate all the papers out there, but that's, it's the, uh, um, and well, maybe machines will generate all the scholarly papers down the line, and then that's an interesting thought, isn't it? So, but, <laughs> how do you peer review that? But, um, uh, in terms of, uh, the, the, the machine reading, um, in the UK AI review, Jerome Pacenti, who now works at Facebook and I, put one of the things we recommended was that the government should encourage um, the right to read is the right to mine data. Um, I believe the European law is gonna, the, on privacy is going to say something different to that. And these are, these are things that are being discussed at you know, the highest levels, really. But Vint is looking at... Uh, you wanted to come back on something there, Vint, yeah. So first of all, these are all extraordinarily stimulating insights that we're getting from the panel, and I've been jotting down notes, so a few observations. One question, what skills should we be worried about? Will people create skills that we consider potentially hazardous? So that's something for us to put in the back of our heads. Um, another question is whether uh, the mechanisms that we've been talking about can help us detect harmful intent or harmful content. Uh, those of us at Google, YouTube, Facebook, and others are struggling with scale uh, to, uh, to deal with uh, that kind of problem. Um, there is a group that's uh, focused on security right now, the Global Cybersecurity uh, mm -hmm. Council. And they came up with a very interesting idea uh, called the public core of the internet, and their notion was to establish international norms for the protection of that public core. I bring this up because the notion of norm may turn out to be a very important step in the direction of trying to manage some of the potential hazardous side effects of the technologies we're talking about. So norms may turn out to be our friend, especially if you are worried about having 193 countries worth of different uh, rules and regulations for the application of these technologies. Uh, Kira uh, raises a very interesting uh, scene for us to consider. And uh, as I think about machines learning from machines, I start to wonder about emergent properties that could mm -hmm. arise from this kind of collective uh, learning. We've been experimenting at Google with uh, neural networks once they've been trained and then transferring exactly the weighting of those neural networks into others so the machines literally learn from each other in a very direct way. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm beginning to see the possibility of a product emerging called compositions of skills where users invent these compositions and then make them available maybe for free. Maybe they would like to be paid for the use of the skills that they have composed. Uh, based on uh, on their uh, uh, experiences. There's a similarity in my mind to this uh, Kira's notion of the composition of skills uh, and 3D printing. Because uh, you can imagine somebody uh, making available a 3D printed design and someone else uh, expanding on that or, or doing a design that fits with it so that multiple printers uh, act on some object and produce an outcome after several steps. So this idea of 3D printing and cooperative assembly all kind of comes to mind as we think about all this. Um, and finally, Ruhi said something that I resonated very strongly with. With all the data that we're accumulating, one of the most interesting tools we have for absorbing and doing something with it is the multi-layer neural networks which in a sense abstract huge amounts of specific, specific information into uh, some kernel of understanding. Tim or Anton, do you want to add anything to, have you got your mic there, Tim? Add anything to the debate? I suppose sparks off of the previous comments. Um, the value of uh, having a market for data, I'm a little bit cautious about that one. I think that when we're uh, looking at uh, when you look at personal data, then uh, there was this uh, uh, slick phrase, uh, data is the new oil, uh, yeah. that came out, and it's completely misleading. Data is not the new oil. Data is not oil. Uh, 
reason, uh, for example, you know, it's different from oil. If I give you my oil, I don't have any oil anymore. Okay, there are fungible things. This, the difference is fungibility. If I give you water, if I give you air, I don't have them. There's a fixed, there's a, there's a conservation. If I give you my data, I still have it. So, if you want to talk about them as markets and so on, they are they just work in different ways. And so, comparing data with oil is kind of not very useful. And then, when it comes to personal data as well. The concern is that if we start talking about personal data as though it's just a personal asset, then it'll be all be a question of how can I help the consumer make, maximize the value of their personal, this personal asset that they have that is so far underexploited, how can I get them a good deal? How can I get them lots and lots of freebies and, uh, and machine designed shirts for, uh, in return for their data? So uh, in fact, uh, I, I prefer to look at data as being uh, my right. I like to talk. Uh, I, I don't want to sell it. I do want to be able to allow other companies to deal with it. But I want my bank to, bank to be able to, for example, I want Amazon to be able to look at details of my family in great detail, so they can find really great present, birthday presents for the nephew. Uh, never mind rem uh, uh, remembering what I gave him last time. Um, uh, but I want Amazon to use that information only for the purpose. Of finding, uh, uh, of finding presents for my, for, for my family. So I think we need to talk a lot, a lot more about the use, the, the type of use of data. We need to do that with medical data. We need to do that all sorts of things. So in general, not, we're not talking about locking data down. We're talking about uh, different types of uses, cataloging uses of data. Are we using it in an emergency to save my life? Are we using it uh, in anti-terrorism? So, or are just we, we're using it for commercial basis? We, uh, and so, and, and talk about my data is a right. Talk, I think one of the things, if you, if you think about data as, your, as its value to a third party, then you ignore the fact that actually the greatest value, my da data is more valuable to me than to anybody else, because it's about me. Okay, so if, I, if you sell it to some guy out there in the cloud, uh, some insurance company, the, to them I'm just a dotted in a huge data field. To me, I'm me. So what is much more interesting for me is to getting hold of my data being, and having agents which work for me uh, so I can integrate, get data from all the different aspects of my life where there is data about me, bring it all together under my control. And then, so I would like to run AI which runs under my control and reports to me. I think when you, in general, whenever you look at an AI, the question to ask is, who does it work for? Alexa, who do you work for? Well, you don't work for me, I know. Uh, all these AIs out there Very work for good. somebody. Very good point, Tim. Antoine, I anything from Facebook? Or, oh, all right, Ben, and then I, we I can just go out to the audience. I can't resist the, uh, the uh, bon mot. Uh, maybe you should write an editorial called, Is Data the New Snake Oil? <laughs> <laughs> we'll Anton, okay. quick comment from you before we go out to the audience. Yeah, um, I think... It's, this is very interesting because I think there is, uh, when, we t when the, the word AI, because data is the new oil, is a misleading, very, uh, AI by itself is very misleading as well. <clears throat> I think there are, there are two, two types of things. There is the data, which is by itself, which is, is not useful. I mean, it, it can be useful for you if you can look at it, but it doesn't do much. And then there are the tools that you apply on the data, okay? And, uh, and the tools, this is where a lot of the machine learning comes into play, okay? But it doesn't work on the data by itself. It has to be trained, the data has to be curated, has to be labeled, has to be et cetera. And so I think that a lot of the, so, and there are two questions there. I think the data, how to use it, why? The transparency that we make with the data, these are actually very important questions, and I think they are discussed right now. And then there are the tools. And there are the tools, this is where a lot of very very interesting capabilities could come uh, in terms of transparency, in terms of compositionality of skills, in terms of learning with your samples, in terms of basically learning how to abstract the world, in terms of learning how to understand human beings. These are actually very, very uh, interesting like lines of research that are actually Pretty preliminary for all of them, for a machine to have an understanding of the physical world. It's actually very preliminary, but this is super interesting. And so I think we should be really, really, and this is where we should really be full force. We, we want to have better algorithm there. We want to uh, be able to, uh, them to, uh, to understand the world better. I think we want uh, algorithms that are able to compose themselves to form new things under our own control, but these are just software. I think we can control that. 
But then, when you apply them on which data and which condition, mm. that's where actually you, are, you have to be You're careful. quite right to separate those out. And we, uh, so we're now going to try and open this up. Um, I'm going to go to uh, Fabian here is looking at Twitter. We've got a question on Twitter that he's going to ask one of the panel, and then we'll go out to the audience. So uh, one of the questions is, uh, I quote, uh, talking about the future of data as currency to empower data owners, I see the point, but not totally convinced without prior education about the risks and danger. What will be the consequences of monetized self? Oh, well, so first of all, good questions. I even uh, will uh, react to all the comments before that. Many countries, when they teach in school, they start with, are you willing to die for your country? This is your right for a country. Are people willing to die for their data? And I'll explain, because when you don't share your health data, you're actually causing somebody else not to live. Because if somebody will solve this specific person, it's actually preventing somebody else from getting treated. The Israel government actually gave billion shekels for the next five years for digital health, where the idea is to provide for each citizen the ability to have personalized health care. And I think this is where we should go with the data. Eventually, my life worth infinite amount of money. This is the best currency. We share this currency in taxes. We share this currency in many other ways. Okay, the population is getting much older, and not sharing this data is actually causing us not to be able to treat some of this generation. We all know about terror as well. You don't share your data, you're actually causing somebody at some point to lose their life. And this is, I think, again, this is the full extreme. Now, Coming back to a question about more about the economy. Are people educated enough about using money? Bitcoins? I think people are not educated for this, and this is something that we need to start from early education in school. The same thing will go around data. I, I'm not sure that data is going to be exactly as the new currency. You're not going to be using it and giving it for food, giving it uh, back. But it's going to be part of the services, and you're going to be the full owner of this. We're going to have regulations thinking about this. When is the right? for the entire population to own your data, specifically for healthcare when it can be owned by others, and when you're the only one who can be actually responsible for this. So for example, giving it to Amazon only for a present, or for my niece, that would be wonderful. But having a full control of this and actually teaching us how to use this is just how to use a search engine. Nobody taught us to use a search engine. We just came inside, it was natural enough. I think a long time we're gonna have enough rules and we're gonna be handling this as humanity about how to do it. Okay, there's so much in all this, but we need to get um, out to the audience. There are, can we put the lights up? Okay, so I'm just some rules here. Um, uh, I'm gonna take three questions and we won't have time for many rounds, maybe two rounds of this. If you're tweeting, tweet questions and Fabian will be look at them or comments. And anyone who can come up with a good last question for the traditional one-line answer, that would be fantastic. Um, so, uh, say who you, I know who you are, but say who you are and make your point or ask your question. So you have to think, remember these, and we're gonna go have three, yeah. I'm Daniel Schwabi from IW3C2 and the Catholic University in Rio. I'd like to take up uh, Vint's uh, remark uh, and get the uh, panel's opinion on one thing that seems to be missing are uh, values and ethical uh, rules or ethics in general, uh, which seem to be missing in the discussion. And I feel that somehow we should uh, incorporate them both in the algorithms and the data itself that is being stored and shared and uh, disseminated. Thank you. Yep. Thanks, Daniel. Well, that, I think we had one on ethics, but we can come back on that. Who's next up at the mic? Yeah, say who you are. Yeah. Hello, Dadiet from Ladies Lyon. Uh, there was another word that was uh, quite uh, absent, lacking is privacy. Uh, the KG, times are changing, I know, but the KGB or the FBI would have paid a lot of money in order to uh, implement bugs into people's houses. And now you accept people to buy and to pay for digital uh, intelligent assistant that listens all the time. And how can you convince one. us users to 
pay for that thing that we don't know where our information, when we are listened to, and how our data goes. There were some uh, aspects treated about GDPR, but how we are sure that the data you are uh, recording is not uh, stored in uh, US uh, soil and, and accessible by the FBI. Uh, you're opening up a whole new can of worms there, which, we've, which is fine. Um, uh, you know, we've been talking mostly what the big companies are doing with our data, what the governments are doing with our data. Um, uh, there's another, we'll, we'll come back to that. And then there's a, uh, someone there in the middle. Say who you are, you, and what. Yes, I'm, I'm Christine Lund, and I work here locally in, Lo in Lyon as, as a researcher. I am the leader of a laboratory of excellence called... Aslan working on the complexity of language. And my question also has to do with ethics. Uh, recently, uh, Google, Amazon, and Facebook created this ethical council, and we didn't hear much about that. Um, I'm wondering, uh, we've heard about uh, driverless uh, cars leading to, we had our first death on that. We've talked about uh, social media. Uh, fake news leading to negative political consequences. We haven't really touched on the social uses of robots and all the ethical considerations that uh, we can think about related to that. But my question is really at the different levels, the government level, uh, the company levels, and even from the bottom up, how can we measure the impact that we have on uh, how can we measure uh, the ethical considerations, that progress that we're making on that? Well, interesting. Those three questions are all very related. Who wants to start? Kira, and then Vint. <laughs> I'll give a controversial opinion. Buttons, yeah. <laughs> right. Um, there's a lot of buzz around bias, ethics. At this point, I'm more worried about uh, computer vision not being able to differentiate between a cat and a banana. Okay. <laughs> Uh, and growing at a really nice thing on Twitter, uh, I think almost a year ago, said that worrying about singularity or worrying about machine learning and artificial intelligence taking over the world is like worrying about overpopulation in Mars. Eventually, we're going to get there. Eventually, going to be people, and eventually, it's going to be overpopulation. I think treating these topics right now is super important around the ethics and diversity, but they should by far not prevent scientific advances because all the extra privacy and uh, prohibitions that we have today on the data are actually preventing that's us a, from making scientific discoveries. That's a very interesting viewpoint. Before I go to, I see Tim wants to say something, and Vint was first, but we're going to take three more. So, Yoel, go back to the mic. Well, I think we've got time for two rounds of these. So, this, Vint. Okay, so uh, values. Um, this is, of course, uh, the essence of, of ethics. What values do our ethics uh, indicate? I would start with the premise, first, do no harm. And I think even though that's not actually in the uh, uh, medical profession, whatever that uh, list of uh, ethical practices, it's implicit uh, in there. And so you can take that notion and expand it pretty dramatically across a wide range of, of things. For example, integrity of data, which we didn't discuss, turns out to be pretty important. You don't want false data about your medical record, for example, to be used in order to treat you. Uh, Tumas Elvis, the former president of Estonia, says he's more worried about accuracy and integrity of his medical data than he is about its privacy, because he doesn't want somebody to change his blood type and then have a transfusion that kills him Quite. because the data was Quite. bad. And so integrity turns out to be very important. Uh, in terms of metrics, uh, certainly I think transparency helps a lot, explaining to people what data you accumulate and what you do with it and how you do that, I think, is the beginning of establishing more trust between the users who, whose data is, is being uh, accumulated and applied. So those are simple beginning steps of trying to introduce a good ethical component uh, to the way in which companies use data. Tim, you have something to say? Uh, or Anton? Yeah. Yeah, no, I just wanted to, to, add, uh, to add something about uh, the, eth the ethical. I, I really think that uh, the community uh, have been a bit caught by, by surprise, uh, by the impact. I mean, it's, and so I think we are catching up. Uh, in the, the partnership on AI had been mentioned. It's been announced last year. Uh, now the, the, there is a director. The community are starting to form. So this, these are, I mean, this stuff takes, uh, takes some time. So I think we, you know, it can't happen in a second that uh, we see. And 
as Kira says, the technology is evolving as we speak, so it's very hard to, to define principle on stuff that might eventually happen if everything works in the end. So um, I think the, the ethics are more like the usage of data, the storing of data, the accuracy of data are actually uh, a, a bit easier to do. Uh, the second part in terms of uh, giving back trust about how people can, uh, how, what we do with the data, um, and this is something that uh, maybe you said about uh, the AI getting back, and this is my AI, and actually I, I control it, and my AI can tell me where my data is used and how, uh, because even you, your data is actually pretty huge, and so you can't really lo look at all the logs of everything you're doing in everywhere. Uh, this is not going to be possible. So even if you wanted to track everything, uh, it's going to be, so we, we need an AI there. So how can we build like decentralized AI or AI that live like on a device and that you know that even if you, could, could, if you don't have internet, you don't have uh, Wi-Fi, wi you don't have the Bluetooth, you don't have anything GSM, you still can talk to your AI and still respond because it's, it's really local. I think this kind of stuff can actually give you uh, a bit of trust and you can actually uh, use that hmm. to monitor. Going fast, Tim, then Rui, and then three more questions, comments. It's hard to do this fast, but, but <laughs> as somebody has said, uh, that don't worry, uh, we won't have uh, AI getting out of control until we've got people, on, uh, we're all living on Mars. Then, uh, if you've got to see the, the, the you know, I remember Asimov's uh, rules of, uh, where Asimov imagined that because a robot was a logical thing, you could just program in a rule, do not harm people, and it would be put programmed in. And in fact, AI isn't like that. So AI is squishy like people. It doesn't have, a, a, you can't just uh, do that just as you can't. Let's talk about people. Let's talk about um, uh, robots, people, and, and, and corporations. So uh, people have values, but even though people, we trust, we rely on them having values, when you get them together, they, don't, they sometimes get out of control as well. And uh, it's not as though they're programmed like Asimov rules either to always do, uh, do good. And sometimes they can't even figure out what it needs to be to do good. But when you go to people, when you go to robot builders and say, hey, when are they gonna take over the world? They say, do you know how difficult it is to build a robot? Okay, fair enough, because when I'm in the uh, X mark in a robot getting those Getting those eyelashes right and getting the uh, the human light, you know, getting the uh, uh, getting the blue eyes and everything is really really hard. But that's not what we're talking about. When we're talking about AIs uh, having an effect on humanity, we are talking about AIs in the cloud. We're talking about say AIs. Uh, we, know we already have jobs that only hum that only AIs can do. Humans need not apply to be to invest in fast trading. In fact, in trading in general, if you want to trade on a stock market, you'd better be an AI. So throughout the financial industry, there's an understanding that it's often best to do the, you could pick which companies do well uh, by uh, looking at the ones that have good AI. Imagine that we allow companies, not only these companies that automatic trade, automatically also create new companies. Very easy, you just make the, the API to company's house be, oh, be read-write. You can, the company's house in the UK has an API. Supposing now, as a company, I can now create a new company, and I can create, and I can instantiate, I can, three different companies with slightly different versions of myself, put them into AWS, have them running my own, and so I'm now creating new companies, and every time I create a new company, I make it, make it slightly different, and I make it slightly more competitive. Now, when you're talking about a, a company, then a company is designed to run just to, uh, for money. So the companies that survive will be the ones that will be ruthless. So the AIs which are running those companies which survive will be the ones that are ruthless. Those will be the AIs that learn to pay their salesmen commission. Those will be the ones that learn to pay their CEOs on commission. Those AIs will be the ones that learn to pay their boards members, boondoggles, and, and, uh, uh, and uh, trips to uh, interesting bars downtown. And, and so those are the AIs which learn to manipulate the people involved. And those AIs won't be robots. They won't be, we won't be worrying about whether robots are given equal rights under the rules. Those AIs will be corporations, and guess what? We've already given them equal rights under the law. Damn it. <laughs> the cat is out of the yeah. bag. Too late. Yeah, good point. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, right, we get Rui, short as you can. Then we're gonna... Okay. 
this will be short. I think they, uh, uh, people are uh, worried about their data for right reasons. Uh, you know, uh, this is something that you probably read uh, 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 in papers uh, or LinkedIn. That if you are not paying for a product, you are the product. I think that is what people are worried about. When you look at it from the customer's perspective, uh, Kira was talking about healthcare. I think if the data is going to be used for the society is good, like you know, medical research and other things, personalized medicine, I think people are more than willing to share their data. Uh, but if there is profit to be made in the end, then they want to you know, know uh, all the fine prints, they want to control uh, their data, they want transparency for the right reason. And, uh, you know, uh, I, I think it's, in simple terms, giving a control of the, all their data to people, being transparent about that is key. Yeah. I'm speeding things up, so because the minister's here to close the session. So we'll have the three panelists, uh, sorry, three comments. We have three people at the mics. We'll start with Yoel. Be as, short, be as brief as you can to make your point. Yoel. Sure. Hi, uh, I'm Yoel Marek. I'm a member of the IW3C2 and a VP of Research at Amazon. Um, so Wendy is going to hopefully to forgive me, but I would like to urge all of you to attend the IW3C2 town hall meeting this afternoon, because this is your way to influence on the future of this conference. So that was a shameless ad, you forgive me. And now my, my question, uh, actually to the panels, we've been talking quite a bit right now about the negative effects and the fears, uh, what can happen with AI, but I would like actually to ask our distinguished panelists to give us a, a more positive uh, vision. And maybe as a closing question to all of you, could you encourage our young researchers in the crowd, our young um, you know, students who are fully part of this audience, and tell them what you think they should research to improve you know, the future of technology and society in AI? That's my question. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, uh, Augustin Chantron from Columbia University, and what a great question. Thank you, Yvonne. Uh, I, first, I just want to react to the fact that ETA ethics could actually prevent in the, 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 the progress of scientific understanding. I think we are actually proving it every day. This conference organized ethical session where we understand how to better design algorithms that could be efficient and ethical at the same time. Uh, so I think it's an important uh, answer to, to one point that was made. Uh, and in the FAT conference, in the web uh, track and society here, we, we work every day on that. And I, I think it's, a, it's important to, to work at partnership with industry. My question is, is simple. We have a long, uh, complicated debate whether we should regulate data collection or data usage. Uh, this is sort of very difficult to, to, to solve that problem. And I was very interested to see what would be your answer, maybe as a final question to conclude? <laughs> Thank you. And the final from the audience. Hi, uh, this is Bharat. I recently finished my PhD from Georgia Tech. Well done. Um, <laughs> my dad was the founder of Internet in India uh, called ERNet Project, and he wanted to convey my regards to uh, Winton Surf, who he, who he knows well. <laughs> now, my quick question was, I know we have talked a lot of high-level uh, things, uh, but... Um, specifically in the current setup, how can AI be developed with controls in place? Like what I mean is under constraints. So for example, there's GDPR which is coming up, which is regulating some of the privacy around data. And how can we develop, for example, AI within the GDPR constraints? And are there any experiments that are, that are happening and any outcomes that you can share? Okay. Thank There's you. too detailed a question for them to answer, but they haven't got time. You can have panel. One or two closing remarks, okay? Tim, should we go in the order we started with? Tim, you go first. Or would you like to wait and think about it? Go on. Uh, fine, I'll pick up the... Uh, I think that, that uh, yes, that is a good question, but too, but, but too deep. The general question is, is a nice closer. Uh, what should everybody do? What should everybody do? Uh, what should the researchers do? Uh, so I would say uh, enable the human being. I would say... Uh, uh, work hard to uh, to make more and more uh, data to fight for individual data being available for things like uh, open data for, for fight for regulation fight for it uh, but, but also in your companies uh, make the, uh, lots of apis uh, uh, build uh, get get your companies building to, st to standards and uh, 
conventions like SOLID so that I, don't, I can write one program to access cr uh, across them all. Um, uh, Ruben Benz at, uh, at the, uh, the Oxford Lab has a project called the Respectful Alexa, which is like an Alexa, except it works for you. It works for the user, and it's specifically they're thinking about okay, how, w what sort of things can we put in which will specifically uh, allow uh, this? Uh, if if you have something which you trust, and therefore you enable it by giving access to all your data, then what? Uh, w other benefits can you uh, get? So, uh, so I'd say, do uh, imagine a world in which uh, that you have to imagine it at the moment, but in which I do have access to all the data that's about me, and I also have access to huge amounts of wonderfully rich uh, public open data, and I also have uh, access to data about all the things, projects I'm involved in, and all the groups, and of all different, different scales. So I have access to data from all kinds of groups across different scales in a sca scale-free sort of way. In that world, then build, uh, then build really powerful systems. Build it whether I am the uh, the naive end user, uh, or also I think, uh, or the developer, or in between. I think a really interesting class of users are the people who. Uh, the, who can do spreadsheets, all those people who are pretty smart out there, and if you give them some pretty powerful tools to use, use their data, uh, they will... Uh, just one remark, okay? Yes, Tim, it was one remark. Fabian here is sweating a bit because of the timing. Uh, uh, Vint, your last comment. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, people come here to hear you guys talk, so that's fine. Uh, three, three points very quickly. First of all, we all worry about inadvertent data sharing. This is where systems get penetrated and all kinds of user information goes away better tools for security uh, practices are needed. Second, there's deliberate data sharing, and there we should care a great deal about actions taken by companies who accumulate data and then do something with it. Transparency, norms, and rules, I think, are the tools that we need for that. And finally, here's an interesting idea. We've been talking about AI and composing AI skills and things like that. What if we put these skills to work protecting our data? Could we do that? Could we invent that could skills to do that? backfire hugely, but yes. <laughs> Antoine. Yeah, uh, <laughs> so uh, sh quickly, um, I would love to have an AI working for me. I'm, I'm working on that every day, but it's slow. Um, I think uh, the, for the first question about how we can bring more people into the, the AI space, I think the, it's more like we need more people in the AI space. We need more diversity for people working in AI. We need more ge different gender. We need more de demographics. We need people from different countries. We need people from uh, all around the world because I think some, uh, we talked about a lot about ethics of dealing with data. I think the part of the, the problems as well are coming with, between like, uh, there is a, a small set of people who are actually uh, are, uh, working on this right now, and so they don't have all the answers. It's, they have a specific point of view sometimes. So if we can open this up, open to new perspective, and that goes with the open source, etc., uh, that should that would be wonderful. Uh, this, is, this goes from the researchers, but also from the whole spectrum from the general public that should be a bit more educated or we should more in terms of what AI can do, all the spectrum with developers, etc., that could be accessing AI as tools to actually the people building the AI. So I think we really want we really need to bring everybody with us in AI. Very important point. Kira, last word to you. I'll finish with the positive. You are all aware of the Moore's Law, that technology is going to be smaller, cheaper, etc. In 2012, Nature published a really interesting article calling it the E-Room Law, saying that every year developing a new drug is going to take twice the amount of time, twice the amount of money. We are currently on the urge of an industrial revolution in healthcare, and I don't believe we can do it without artificial intelligence, without machine learning. This is exactly where we need to focus as a community as well of creating new drug discovery algorithms, thinking about how we use all the data we've already collected with the GDPR, without the GDPR ready for the human good. Thank you, Rui. Yeah, I, I think sometimes we feel like we, uh, I feel like we are too much worried about uh, AI. I think we, there are a lot of you know, accomplishments, successes, but they really, when you're going deep in a particular area, like driving, self-driving cars, but I think we are far away from broad AI. <coughs> you know, a general intelligence. So to me, that's years ahead. Yeah. Thank you. So um, it's been a great honor to chair this panel. I particularly want to thank Tim and Vint, not just for being here today, but for everything they've done for the world. Thank you. And I'd like to thank our in industry panel members, because it's, 
you know, you with the governments and with us as society, it's our responsibility jointly, as Luciano said, to make sure the legacy of what people like Tim and Vint have done is used for the good. And talking about the government. Oh, hang on, <laughs> hang on. Yes, hang on. Yes. And now I'll hand back to Fabian because it's a great privilege to have the uh, French Secretary of State here. So, yes, finally to conclude this plenary session, <clears throat> sorry, it is my honor to call on stage the French Secretary of State for Digital Affairs. Please join me in welcoming Monsieur le Ministre Mounia Majoubi. Hi, everybody. Well, I, I, before starting what I was here to tell you today, I, I just wanted to say how impressed I am by the quality of the panelists. I was behind here listening to you, and I'm quite uh, astonished as well by the quality of this event. So I would like to thank all the organizers, and I would like to thank you for the scientific aspects, and thank you here, everybody that comes from abroad. Who comes from abroad here in the audience? Thank you, everybody, to uh, come here to Lyon, one of the most beautiful cities in Europe, maybe after Paris. <laughs> but, <laughs> but thank you, everybody, and I'm very, very honored to be here today. So I, I wanted to, to tell you a few words today about the state of AI and the role of the states on AI. And that's something very important uh, to talk about, because once AI was the subject of experts, was the subject of a few, and we all were very happy to disagree with each other uh, theoretically and practically and having long debate that nobody could understand. But now, AI is the subject of the society as a whole, and we all have a responsibility to have a public debate on the subject. We all have to have a complete dedication of the government, but the society as a whole to develop AI, but also to question AI, and it's all about uh, uh, the discussion you had during your panel and a uh, previous one. So we are not talking about future times. Sometimes people are talking about AI on everything it could bring to our society, on everything it could transform on our society. The time of AI has already come, and it's here for a long time. It's everywhere in our lives, voluntarily or involuntarily. And that's maybe one of the most important political aspects. There is a volunteer way to use AI, to use algorithms, to use new technologies and progress, but there is also, and there are more, uh, and there are more people uh, touched by this aspect, involuntary use of AI. As a citizen, when the country is using algorithms to deliver public policy, but also as a consumer with companies, with health uh, institutions. So AI is everywhere, so people have to be everywhere, and the conscience of people has to be everywhere. So there is no doubt now that this transformation has only begun. I often say that everything we've seen the last 30 days on digital and uh, digital research is just a draft of what we're going to see in the next five to 10 years. Just a draft, and look at what the draft has already uh, done in 30 years, and let's figure out what could be this transformation in five to 10. Every people that would tell you how is the world in 10 years is a liar or is trying to sell you something. But what we can say is that it's gonna be very, very different. And our role as political leader is to prepare the world to any possible future and be sure that every citizen will have a place in this possible future to come. So we have one challenge with AI, is how do we make AI to serve our ideals, and not how do we, society, serve AI. And this question of passivity versus being active is maybe one of the most important ones, and that's why we have to come from the few to the society as a whole. And we need to develop our own model, a European model, because today AI is mainly developed by leading firms coming from one continent, and there's another continent developing other firms that are very competitive on AI, but they are also very different. Because if you look at how 
a continent is focusing on economical performance, you'll see that another continent will be focusing on control, control of population, control of the economy. But at the heart of everything is performance. But what I believe, what we believe here in Europe and in France, is that there is a way for France and Europe to develop a European perspective on AI that is a great balance between performance, because performance has to be the main objective, but with one goal, that is to serve the humans. And that's why uh, President Macron organized a worldwide event in France three weeks ago called AI for Humanity. And it's both a social engagement that we have, but it's also a competitive argument, a competitive advantage, saying that in Europe, we will be leaders on AI, but we will be leaders with value. And we all have different value in the world, and I believe that we have to be proud of them, and we have to have them completely diffused within our research and within our ecosystem. For that, if we want to have this AI with values, there are a few elements that we can build on. The first one is about diversity. AI looks like the one who developed it. And if we don't manage, if we don't focus and create priorities to have a more diverse set of people working on AI, we will have problem, not in 10 years, not in five years, but next year. If we only have young men uh, graduated from the same school working on the same subject, we will have issues. There is this question of women on AI, but women in digital. For the third year in a row, we are doing worst in terms of number of women studying digital studies in France. Yes. For the last three years, we are doing worse and worse and worse. So this is unacceptable. We have a priority on that. But we also have a subject about social diversity. If AI is only developed by a very urban, international, cosmopolitan elite, then it will look like the life of these people that most of the people here in this assembly, including me, we belong to. But AI, as it is transforming the life of everyone, has to include everyone. This question of inclusion will be very, very priority to us in the coming years. A second condition to make AI responsible, to make AI performant and serving the humans is about control. But not control to limit, control to a low performance, and at the same time, to be sure that we are doing it in the right way. There is this question of building ways, research ways, to control, analyze, and understand what is happening with AI. One of the worst things that could happen to AI is to make it ununderstandable to the people. The question of understand the, to make research and progress understandable to the people is key. Because if we don't do it, people start with science with trust in our uh, democratic society. But if we don't work and focus on helping them to understand what we are doing, look at what is happening. From trust, you will go to fear, and from fear to distrust. And you go to trust, from trust to fear when people experience the bad consequences of AI or technology. For example, you receive a decision that was fully made by a computer, you try to contact the public service, but nobody's answering you, and then you will start to say, huh, it's all about the machine, it's all because of the machine. And then it will break something in your heart, something in your mind. And then the next time you read the paper about this uh, private data from Facebook, something Cambridge, I don't get it, but it, it looks bad. It will break another little thing in your heart. And then, because people will talk about what they found on the computer of their uh, 13 years old kids, and you say, wow, that's the internet, that's terrible. And then, far by far, worse by force, people will distrust technologies. And what will happen? I already see it sometime at the National Assembly when I debate on digital technology applied to public services. I see people telling me, well, we don't want your technology. We like the paper thing. We like human talking to us. Because every time you talk about progress, we only see the bad effect of progress. The thing with that is that if we don't work on inclusion, if we don't work on explaining what we are doing and what you are doing, then we will radicalize people to be against technology and progress. So I can talk about the fact that we are digitalizing the state and having 100% of public services available online in five years. It's absolutely uh, not 
it, it can't be then uh, possible if I don't work on the already 20% of French people who already said that they don't know how to use digital. So every time we talk about AI, every time about, we talk about digitization, every time we talk about progress, but we don't take care of this 20%, which are sometimes 30% in other European countries, here in their lives, in their communities, they only hear one thing, they are trying to work against us. And then they radicalize, and then they politically radicalize, and if this, this minority becomes a majority, then we will have, and we will have a very big issue on progress because we will lose 10 to 15 to 20 years in terms of progress and technology development. So this question of trust needs from us investment, time investment, money investment, but human investment to explain around us what we are doing. If we don't do it, if we don't do it, then we won't have this conference in five years and we won't be able to talk about technologies and other continents will talk about it for us. But on that, there are strong reasons to believe that France and Europe are on the right path to succeed. First, we have to say, and we are very proud of that, France and Europe have some of the best and incredible researchers in the world on AI, and on digital uh, in general. We have one of the most beautiful institutes, the INRIA, that you perfectly know. And as you've seen, the presence of people of most of all AI laboratories from top international companies, it's a, a testimony of the quality of our public research, of our public education system, and I believe it's something that could, that could if we use it in, on the right way, helps France and Europe to be a champion on this subject. We also host some of the most beautiful public database. In France, for decades, we decided that health has to be socialized, that we will share the risk of health and we will deliver health to every citizen in France. It also creates one of the most beautiful health database in the world because we nearly have 100 million people for decades with all the history of treatment and health, good health, but also death. And it makes uh, it one of the most beautiful ones. Because when you socialize, you also, create data, uh, you also create data assets that could be used. Today, we are working a lot on creating more values from these databases that already exist. We also have very strong industrial bases. Uh, these industrial bases are transforming. They were late, but now, comparing to the rest of the world, they are transforming very rapidly, and you, there is this advantage of starting your transformation a little bit late. You transform with more recent technologies, and that is what's happening right now in Europe, and I believe this trend and this move will go uh, even forward. We also have a great advantage. We have a large population. Europe is five, more than 500 million people, and we also have the investment capacity when we invest all together, and that's why the question of Europe is very important. No country in Europe has the power to compete in investment in AI. But all together, we can become the first region in the world to invest. So that's now a political question. That's now a democratic question on how we decide to become one market, to become one people, to decide to invest together for this progress. Not only for the competitivity, but also because we have a project together. And to us, that's very important. So, if we look at everything that has been said before, if we look at everything that has been around, announced recently, France has announced a national AI strategy. Europe yesterday morning with Maria Gabriel, the European Commissioner for Digital, has announced the European strategy for AI. There are a few elements that we can have in mind. The first is the investment in digital skills. Inclusion skills, the first 20 hours on digital, to talk to the 20% I was talking before, but also high, very high level digital skills to have more people graduating on digital subjects in France and in Europe, making their life easier and having a focus on public research because we are strong believers that public research is the key lever to uh, inject AI transformation all around the economy. And that's something we've started to invest on 40 years ago when we created INRIA. Uh, 40 or 50? 40? 50 years ago, sorry, when we created the, the, the Institute for Digital Research. Um, we also believe that we need to create a, a level playing field in Europe 
and you can find on the, the national uh, newspaper Les Echo this morning a tribune I wrote with the European Commissioner on the future of platforms in Europe, talking about uh, calling for a European regulation that permits performance and innovation and at the same time create positive values in the life of European people. And there are also new subjects that we will have to discuss in the coming months and the coming years. The statue of some private data sets that could have a role in innovation and change the lives of people, but that are now not enough used by private, the private sector. We already announced on a voluntary basis. We are not socializing all private data from all companies. We are inviting companies to share their data with each other because we believe that on some sectors, especially on agriculture, on health, on transportation, on energy, sharing the data between competitors can be even more stronger uh, in terms of innovation than the sum of innovation of, all the, of each of the actors. So this is something new because it hurts a lot of common uh, beliefs that we had on uh, private property and, and, and entrepreneurship, but I believe it's a new way to rethink the future and to reshape the commons for tomorrow. So will it be enough? Nobody knows. How will be the life in 10 years? As I told you, if someone is telling you he's lying. So everything we have to do as government is to prepare people for this future. So in one word, to sum up everything I've said, we want to focus on skills, we want to focus on people, we want to focus on experts, but with one goal in mind is to be at the service of every citizen and to be at the service of the human. So thank you very much for being here. Thank you very much for debating. Thank you very much for sharing. And I will be more than happy to come back in a few years and be sure that we'll be even, even more people here, even more people that are not experts, and the, the debate will help us to shape champions here in Europe. Thank you very much. Thank you. À bientôt. Thank you very much. And now, the last thing I have to say is we are on break. He may still be here, but he's, he's going to walk in the exhibition area so we can introduce you. Bonjour.